Um, our next speaker again is Dr. Uh, Bansell. We heard from him earlier, and he's going to be talking about how peripheral cannulation VA ECMO may actually uh, some complicate. What is it? Complications, complications of peripheral uh, cannulation for VA ECMO. Talking about VA uh, ECMO and its complications, uh, Joe had asked me to talk about uh, um, what the effects of VA peripheral VA ECMO on the LV. Uh, I, I thought that it would be very difficult to give a 20-minute talk on that. So we're going to talk about, uh, I think it's one of the complications of peripheral cannulation. No financial disclosures relevant for this talk. Uh, we got to start with the history of ECMO, and uh, that definitely um, uh, is very important. Uh, first hot lung machine used in 1956, uh, prolonged life support began in 1960s and that's the time frame that we're talking about like 50 60 years that these things have matured ecmo was originally studied only for adult purposes and first successful case was done in 1971 what revived ecmo adult ecmo i'm talking about adult ecmo not uh, pediatric side h1n1 that was the most important thing First case was around April 15, 2009, and CDC started working on the vaccine on April 21st of 2009. 20, on April 26, U.S. declares H1N1 as a public health emergency. By June, 18,000 cases, mostly young, previously healthy individuals, were affected by it. 18,000 and estimated that about between 40 to 80 million people had H1N1 between J April of 2009 and April of 2010, with somewhere between eight to 18,000 deaths. Common uh, uh, misconception is that ECMO will uh, uh, somehow treat these things. It actually does not treat, neither does it treat heart, does it uh, treat lung. It's actually just your buying time for these organs to get better. That's the most important. Always have an exit strategy. Very important with any MCS therapy to have an exit strategy. The best data of uh, ECMO comes from ELSO registry. Um, and ELSO registry is the extracorporeal life support organization registry uh, that was started in 1989 uh, at University of Michigan. And uh, 236 centers worldwide uh, currently report data to ELSO. Good quality data for ECMO is lacking, but m because most of the studies that we have are, short, uh, are small numbers, single center. Uh, most of the data is also from the pediatric world, uh, not from the con uh, adult world, and I think it's difficult to correlate from uh, congenital to adults. Uh, if you look at the data, the, the summary results from the 2016 July, the survivors, 56% for respiratory, 58% for respiratory. For cardiac, is 41%, and eCPR is about 30%. This is the survival of patients at the time of discharge. Different from what you would see, that they survived the initial insult, but were they alive when they were being discharged to home or discharged to a facility? Those numbers further go down. What are the type of configuration that we are all very capable and we all understand and use it on a daily basis is the VA ECMO uh, and the VV ECMO. One is obviously veno-arterial, the other one is veno-venous. As you can very well understand, the purposes of each. Most commonly, people debate about how are we going to cannulate? What are the surgical techniques? Uh, is the peripheral better? Is it central better? I think both of them have their own merits and their disadvantages. And uh, central ECMO always is looked upon, hey, that's just too uh, complicated, it increases the bleeding, and it is more aggressive form. Yes, absolutely, N uh, much more invasive. However, I think it provides a very good cent de central decompression. Uh, larger flow, you can put larger cannulas, much better flow. Uh, there is much improved cardiac decompression. And most importantly is that less preload dependence, which is very important actually if you're trying to do uh, cardiac recovery, both 
central decompression, as well as decreased uh, preload dependence. Avoid limb complications that most of us are very well aware when we're doing in, uh, these peripheral ECMOs. Disadvantages, invasiveness. The need for requiring stenotomy, however, less other techniques are also available, less invasive trochotomy approaches. Risk for bleeding, all these patients have end organ dysfunction significantly when they're coming in the form of shock, so their, their coagulation profile is very out of, uh, you know, uh, normal ranges. Um, central cannulation, excellent exposure of central vasculature, right atrium, aorta, you have, you can, capability of even putting a pulmonary artery vent, uh, LV vent you can put from the LV apex. Uh, most of the time we're using it at the time of post periotomy, post heart transplant, or if the peripheral cannulation is not possible. In those individuals, we still go for central cannulation. Uh, head end, foot end, and uh, this is uh, going into the draining one of the uh, 36 malleable right angle that you can tunnel subcutaneously, uh, bring it in, put it in the right atrium, and sewing a graft onto the ascending aorta, you can put one of your uh, regular uh, aortic cannula. That enables you to close the chest if you have put it and uh, tunneled it subcutaneously, and the patients are able to ambulate, as you had seen in the previous picture also. Um, you can do the same techniques. Uh, this is one of my cases that we did for through the right thoracotomy for a patient after uh, a transplant, uh, after the new lungs had been put in. Patients still had uh, profound vasoplegia and uh, significant oxygenation issues. At that time, we decided to put the patient on central cannulation. Very good exposure. You could do the whole lung transplant through these things, bilateral and interlateral thoracotomies. And at the end, if the patient needs to be placed on ECMO, you can do that. Um, and this is how that patient looked. Uh, drain, two of the tubes coming out, trochotomy incisions closed, bilateral lung transplant done. This was the lady who was a 23-year-old, double lung transplant, uh, anterolateral trochotomies, as we had talked about, we did that. Patient was actually able to do very well. We were able to transition the patient, and then finally was able to decannulate. Those central techniques that we talked about, you'd seen it in the previous one, also results in ambulation, exercising all of these patients. Um, you could have a combination of central and peripheral cannulation techniques. Uh, you could use the venous cannulas from the groin to drain, and if you don't want to open the chest in these patients, you can do uh, the return of the arterialized uh, blood back through the axillary artery. A lot of us are now becoming more and more comfortable with this technique because of the use of the impeller technology from the subclavian artery approach. However, there are a few things that need to be aware that uh, uh, this can result in significant enlargement of the arm, um, resulting in sometimes even compartment syndrome. So you have to put, that's what I have learned with experiences, to put a sleeve around the uh, distal portion of your anastomosis, so by limiting the amount of flow that is going into your arm. Complications. A lot of those things can go wrong, as you all very well know, uh, right from creation of the pump, insertion, damage to the vascular structures, mechanical, pump malfunction, tubing rupture, seen it, our institution, twice we have seen tubing rupture, cannula dislodgement. We have seen cannulas coming out at the time in the ICU, we call it the turn of death, because everybody has to be given a bath in the middle of the night, so a turn of death happens, and at that time, most of the cannulas somehow magically come out. Uh, uh, anticoagulation, pump thrombosis, uh, limb ischemia, stroke, and, and on top of that, collateral damage, everything else is going well because of the source response to all of these things. You can have vasoplegia, you can have lung damage, you can have end organ dysfunction, great flows, and still kidneys go away. If you look at the bleeding, the factors that are associated with increased risk of bleeding is a higher PTT on the day prior to initiation of ECMO. A higher Apache score, a higher risk score for your critical care uh, severity. Uh, Post-surgical, obviously if you've done a stenotomy, those are the factors that are increasing the risk for bleeding. Variables associated with 
lower is if the patient was not on anticoagulation the day before initiation of these things. If you look at bleeding sources, most of them are coming from the cannula sites. Cannula sites meaning the insurgent sites. Vascular complication, patient transferred to us exactly this form. This is a picture of this patient. They did a great job, best of their ability, got the patient alive. But patient had cold leg, non-perfusing. We had to take the patient to the uh, operating room, provide a distal perfusion catheter, uh, brought him back like that, and saved the leg of this patient. But if you look at the previous slide, limb complication, the moment you have limb complication, it really affects your uh, survival significantly. Watershed phenomenon. If you look at the watershed, what is watershed phenomenon? It depends upon how you are providing flow to the patient. You have native blood flow that is coming from the heart and the peripherally cannulated patients, you're flowing it back. Look, a lot of deoxygenated blood is coming from the native heart and is going to the right carotid and a lot of, or not a lot, excellent amount of oxygenated blood is going to the rest of the body. So watershed phenomenon is happening in these patients. The other slide shows the same thing. And if you look at it right here on the cross-sectional, uh, the carotids are differently lighted up. LV distension, peripheral ECMO. LV distension is commonly seen in peripheral ECMO. Why does that happen? I think it, because multiple factors again. It is one of the factors is that it provides, increases the afterload significantly from uh, the BA ECMO. The uh, suboptimal venous return accompanying the right heart recovery. Heavy collateral uh, bronchial flows that are present and presence of aortic insufficiency. All of these factors will lead to LV distension. And what will that do? Increase wall stress, increase myocardial oxygen demand, less chances of myocardial recovery. How do we prevent? I think good LV drainage, making sure that we are unloading our LV. People talk about uh, what are the options. Uh, actually, we have a lot of other options. Using a standard intraaortic balloon pump. A lot of centers for first 24, 48 hours use intraaortic balloon pump at the same time to unload the LV. Uh, there are certain transvalvular approaches. Transvalvular approaches include, you could use a $30,000 LV vent called as an impeller on top of the other expenses. Transseptal approaches you can do. You could use a balloon uh, or you could use a tandem. Uh, central cannulation techniques. If your LV is still distended, you're not having good flows, you want to switch your L, uh, peripheral cannulation to central cannulation. Pulmonary artery venting. Pulmonary artery venting has recently been shown that it can also reduce significant amount of uh, LV distension. Balloon septostomy, septostomy can be used uh, uh, by, in the cath lab. Pediatric patients actually in our institutions, they have started using it in the, if you look at the bottom uh, slide, this is pre, when the patient had cannulations and it was in pulmonary edema, and after a septostomy, significant improvement. Same thing, if you use an impeller, you can use that impeller, and in these four slides, you can actually see that there is a lot of smoke that is present out here before the implantation. The LV is significantly distended, right here, completely smoke, all smoke present there. And then once this have been implanted, significant reduction, smoke is gone. Look what happens to the pulmonary capillary wedge, the LVEDD, significant reduction that happens post-implantation. You know, your myocardial oxygen demand has gone down. Your chances of LV recovery significantly gone down. Going to the next topic of intracardiac uh, thrombus. Intracardiac thrombus happens also, a lot of combinations on VA ECMO. One, incomplete dis, uh, 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 decompression of the LV. Imbalances between the endogenous pro and the anticoagulants that are present. Uh, inadequate systemic anticoagulation that we all have at the initiation of uh, VA ECMO. Uh, Large clots present, you have to do a thrombectomy in these kind of patients. Um, what do we do generally to 
prevent this kind of a situation. We use low inotropic support. Patients who are on VA ECMO, we will still use uh, epinephrine or dobutamine to just have LV keep on contracting so that a layered thrombus does not form. Obviously, once this has happened, uh, impella is contraindicated because you have high chances of sucking that into your uh, pump and destroying the pump. Stroke. Real case, my own patient had this problem. Uh, catastrophic outcomes. That's why exit strategy. The day you initiate these devices, that same day with the family, you have to have the talk that w this is going to come to an end. Uh, in spite of, you know, patient's hemodynamic remaining good, we may have to turn it off. And that's one of the most, I think, uh, toughest con uh, conversation that anybody can have. Uh, so overall, I think it is an excellent and important tool uh, for all of the people that are present in this uh, uh, audience. Why? Because we use these things uh, to save our patients on a daily basis. Um, complications, as I talked about MCS, same echoes for uh, mechanical, uh, for uh, ECMO. A lot of those things are present. You have to be very vigilant. You have to be always looking out for those things. And once you have a team approach, I think most of these things can be readily uh, taken care of. Technology, as you uh, listen to the prior talk also, significant improvements are happening. 3D technology, 3D printing is being used. Better cannulas, better um, um, uh, devices are coming. So I think the future is only bright. And I want to thank all our team members at Oxner, all our perfusionists who take care of these patients, our nurses that make us uh, you know, do what we are able to do and provide. Uh, we were uh, very proud to be the ELSO Award for Excellence uh, for three years uh, for uh, uh, our institution. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, uh, thank you for the invitation, Joe.